Willkommen in einem anderen aufregenden Video or welcome to another exciting video, in this case part 36 of my game system design series, in which case I'll be investigating figure gaming playing areas, or specifically the terrain types and densities of terrain you should expect on a figure gaming playing area. In this video I'll be specifically covering the battles of Marengo, Ina Ostdatz, Vagram and Leipzig. After completing my conversion of the first set of SPI Quadra games into a figure gaming format, I made some interesting observations about terrain. This made me think I may be getting terrain very wrong in my normal figure games. Just a quick background, uh, someone on the internet suggested one way of obtaining a good set of figure gaming rules which allow you to simulate an actual real historical battle would be to convert a board gaming into a figure gaming format. The original suggestion envisaged the use of hexes, which was an idea I tried, tried many years ago and rejected. However, it made me think I could still do this if I made some changes to the game system, replacing hexes with a concept of movement and combat zones of control. This actually worked, and I started converting a series of small games, SPI games, into a figure gaming format. The first games were the first SPI Quadra games, and of course the first being Marengo and the other three battles that I mentioned earlier. I've completed the first four Quadra games and will start converting the second set of Quadra games, which are shown here. The second set of Quadra games could be joined together to create one large map, allowing you to simulate the entire Waterloo campaign. I've calculated this would require a playing area of 6 foot by 8 foot, which is rather large but certainly possible. I suspect that aspect of my project may not be practical, but I will convert the rules into a more generic Vigor Gaming format to allow for points based games as well, and allow me to simulate other battles not covered by the SPI games. Nonetheless, I can assure you, setting up a 6 by 8 foot Waterloo campaign game with all those lovely figures will certainly look good and certainly give me lots of photo opportunities, even though as a game it probably would be impractical. Part of me converting the Quadra games into a figure gaming form was converting the board gaming map into a playing area that I could use as figures. I am using 3 foot by 4 foot playing areas to represent the board game maps. The scales between these initial four games do vary, but not as much as I originally thought, which with each hex ranging from between 400 and 800 metres according to the standard rules, but closer to between 250 metres and 600 metres per hex when I analysed the maps carefully. The one thing I really noticed was a large number of built-up areas, rivers, streams and roads, and the seeming lack of woods, woods and also the uneven distribution of woods. Hills were a special catch, which I will cover in more detail later. The first battle I'll be analysing is Marengo. This shows the map of the Battle of Marengo. The Austrians are shown as red. This shows the SPI Marengo board game map in the same format, that is top left corner is where the Austrians are coming from and the French are in the rest of the map or playing area. Each hex on this board game map represents 200-300 metres. The first battle was fought behind the stream in front of Marengo which was about 10 hexes long. I converted this entire map into a 90 centimetre by 120 centimetre playing area and later we'll determine how typical this scale is for normal figure gaming. But for now, let's look at the terrain features. If we ignore Alessandria, there are a lot of built-up areas, each of which is one hex in size, or 200-300 square metres in size, and some two hexes, which are basically 250 by 500 metres in size. Each of these towns, or possibly villages, provide a reasonable defensive bonus for any unit in them thus would probably represent stone buildings. A village of these sizes would consist of about 25 to 50 buildings and have a population between 100 and 200. Just a note, this is larger than a stone farmhouse such as Hugemont. I, su I suspect Hugemont was an 80 square metre or at the most 100 square metre stone building or structure, making it only 25% the, 25 the size of the villages that we see on this map. I rarely deploy any more than three built-up areas on a Napoleonic playing area, each of which is normally a 8cm square. 
On the other hand, when I play World War II or modern figure gaming, I commonly deploy 12 to 24 and built up areas, each of which is normally a 3 cm square or some joined together. My World War II scales are normally between 1 in 5,000 and 1 in 10,000. So perhaps scale could be the reason why we have such a big difference in the deployment of built up areas. We will drill down into this later to see if scale is the cause of the fact that there are lots of small villages deployed in this playing area and you normally don't get that in a figure gaming game. Let's now look at rivers and streams. Rivers in this game are unpassable except at bridges, while streams provide a significant defensive advantage. While I certainly do deploy rivers and streams on my figure gaming playing areas, I rarely have games where I'm forced to fight across a stream. I also never deploy as many water features as you see here. Even in my World War II games, I avoid the use of water features which affect play. This could be due to the scenario as a water feature between two forces reasonably equal in size makes for a very boring game. Once again, we will drill down into this later in the video to see if the scenario is the reason why the river density and position is so different between, let's say, a historical battle and a typical figure game battle. Looking at woods and rough terrain, uh, it's not really that unusual. Woods represent, as you can imagine, woods, and rough represents rough ground. I'm uncertain exactly what rough ground means. Rough terrain does not affect line of sight and only affects movement and defence in, in the SPI game. I don't think it means rough hills, but putting that detail aside, the amount of this terrain of features were, if anything, less than a figure game and not exactly evenly distributed. That is almost certainly due to the terrain the battle was fought over, and I do not see anything, anything significant here. I think uh, the use of woods and rough between board games and figure gaming is probably fairly reasonably similar. The next terrain feature we'll look at is something that's called slopes in the board game. If attacking up a slope, the defender gets a significant benefit. I originally thought this was some kind of unique terrain, but in retrospect, this probably represents significant hills and the slopes running up a hill. Basically, it's a hill. The two takeaways I had were that the combat benefits of being up a hill and the second takeaway was the presence of only two or three hills, um, one very large and two very small on this playing area. While many figure gaming rules have movement penalties for moving up a hill and some rules have reverse slope defensive benefits, the main effect of hill is typically a line of sight. This makes me think that perhaps rules should contain larger benefits for defenders when they're being attacked up a hill. I must note there are some games where you do get um, some defensive, comparatively minor defensive battle uh, advantage if someone's trying to close assault you from a lower position on a hill, but it's normally not to the same extent as this board game where basically the defenders are doubled in defensive strength. There are many accounts of how Blucher was considered foolish not to place his troops behind the crest of a hill or hills at Ligny. Instead, he placed them on the forward slope. These accounts are mainly in English, so it could be because of the English preference of reverse slope deployments. I suspect the reason Blucher did this was being up a hill gave his troops a major benefit of attack. And if we went behind the crest, French skirmishers would simply take the crest and pepper the Prussians from the crest position. The British did not have this issue because their skirmishers could keep the French skirmishers at bay. This is my theory and while it could be wrong, it does explain a lot of what historically occurred, especially with the Prussians. Now we need to compare this map with a typical figure gaming playing area. Perhaps this terrain difference is purely based on difference in scale. So let's try and derive some basic scales so we can compare the two playing areas. In my conversion, each hex represents 4 centimetres, which means 1 centimetre represents from 50 metres to 60 metres on a scale of 1 in 5,000 to 1 in 6,000. While a lot of rules sit in the 1 in 1,000 scale range, the much larger scale rules, such as WRG, uses a scale of 1 in 3,000. Shaker uses 1 in 5,000, Napoleon's Battles 1 in 3,600, DBN about 1 in 3,000, Age of Eagles 1 in 4,000. I will not cover big base rules, instead we'll only focus on standard figure gaming rules, but big base rules vary more and are generally higher than standard element base rules. On the other hand, the individual element or counter is much larger and that does affect what kind of terrain you decide to place on the playing area, so let's not cover big base rules. 
Marenga does not use a larger scale, but the playing area is three foot by four foot. Sorry, Marengo does use a larger scale than the typical figure gaming rule, but the playing area is not that large, three foot by four foot, which by figure gaming standards is small. If I drop the scale at one in 2500, the playing area becomes six foot by eight foot, large but not impossible. At 2500 scale, it's pretty close to a traditional 15 mil gaming rules playing area, and the number of streams and the number of built up areas are still there. So while scale does have some effect, it's not the primary cause of the difference in the way streams and built up areas are deployed compared with a board game and a figure gaming playing area. In conclusion, most figure gaming playing areas lack sufficient built up areas and water features. It's also possible many figure gaming rules do not correctly reflect the effects of slope in combat, but this does actually vary by rules. There is a 25mm effect at play as well. As a general point, terrain features should not be any smaller than an element width, or any terrain feature should accommodate or be able to accommodate a full element. At 25mm, the element width is greater, so the terrain features which could be deployed are reduced. However, this is only a difference of 4cm versus 6cm, so it does not fully provide me with an explanation. Instead, I feel it's convention. In Napoleonic's most area terrain features are much larger than an element base width, possibly twice the size. Why is this the case? This would reduce the number of area terrain features, which it does. In World War II figure gaming, for example, this is not the case, and area terrain features are commonly the size of an element, which is normally 3 centimeters square. Does Napoleonics get it right and World War II figure gaming get it wrong? I expect it depends on what the rules designers want to achieve. In World War II, terrain features were critical and modelling every terrain feature which could be used by a single element is important and necessary. In Napoleonics, most rules designers tend to avoid terrain features as much as possible. The main objective they have is modelling troops meeting each other on a flat terrain. Terrain features just get in the way. However, I suspect in reality, terrain features also did actually get in the way and not having them placed on the playing area does actually reduce the historical accuracy of a typical figure gaming game. In my conversion, I took the SPI board game map and then I created a map, as you can see here, which allows me to build the terrain for a game. The built up areas um, are easy to resolve in my case, as I currently possess three centimeter and four centimeter square built up area terrain pieces which I place buildings on when not occupied by defenders. I just need to deploy more of these on a playing area and I resolve the built up area issue. The hills or slopes are also easy. I just need to create a large flat topped hill resembling the hills shown here. The other two small hills I can ignore or create some small hills to reflect. Actually in my World War II games, I do actually have three centimeter square or roughly square hills. The biggest issues I have here is how do I create the streams and rivers? And I will need, to, you know, I either need to embed this in the playing area on a special MDF playing area or create separate pieces of river and stream terrain which can be placed on top of my standard playing area. In After much thought, originally I thought I would create a special um, MDF playing area which reflected this almost like a board game map, but I've change my mind and I'll be creating the separate, separate pieces which I simply place on my standard map. The roads, however, were the big issue. But in retrospect, roads are only useful when they cross rivers and streams, so I just need to include bridges on my water features. The other use of roads is moving through rough terrain, which I could easily create a special rule which allows this if enemies are not close by. Otherwise, I can simply ignore roads except for aesthetic reasons. Okay, maybe Marengo is an unusual battle. Let's look at the next battle, which is in Austerthus. The Prussians are in red and Jena is in the bottom. Historically, the reason why this was such a disaster were both Prussian forces retreated towards each other when they lost their battle, and when they met, it became an incredible mess. This shows the SPI board game in Alsterdutz. There were actually two bat battles, thus two playing areas, one on the left and one on the right. The ground scale, scale moves up to 400 metres per hex, which means our scale now moves into the 1 in 10,000 range, or 1 centimetre equals 100 metres. 
Clearly, with the ground scale increasing, smaller villages, that is, villages which are smaller than 400 metres square, are now ignored. But we have a bigger area to cover, so there are more larger villages placed on the map. As a result, the uh, built-up area density remains much the same. I don't think built-up density um, is really affected that much by scale. Remember, in this game, each terrain feature is as large as a unit, and that is considered to be sufficient to place here and to have a unit or element placed inside of. So it's a valid terrain feature. Changing the scale from 1 in 200, or you know, 200 metres per hex to 400 metres per hex, simply does not affect the number of built-up areas you place in the playing area. As for water features, there are less and you know, pretty much non-existent. However, the water feature at Ulster does, does have a major play effect, which again is something that typically does not occur in figure gaming games. As for slopes, uh, this game or battle uses a lot more and I've attempted to convert them into what are obviously hills. If my bet guess is correct, there are a lot of hills here, a lot more than you would normally have in a figure game, but nothing that most figure gamers would consider unusual. This is my playing area guide for the battle. I will be creating a 3 by 4 foot playing area, that's my standard playing area, and creating the terrain features that duplicate this for it. As you can see, lots of hills, some woods, and a large water feature in one playing area. I should be able to duplicate this with generic playing area with my generic playing area and terrain features placed on top of it quite easily. I could even uh, possibly place the roads in there if I so desire, but as we've indicated before, there's no real reason to actually put roads in there except for unless you want aesthetic reasons. The next battle we'll be looking at is Vagam, which in this particular map is at the top center where you can see Eugene sitting. In this map, north is at the top, while the playing areas that you'll see in the latter part of the video actually have north pointing in the opposite direction. So just take note when you look at this. Historically, the Austrians' right flank advanced, which was probably an error, but as Napoleon's main effort was on his right flank, expected. This is the SPI board game map for Vergam. Remember, north is pointing at the bottom, so it's in reverse of what you saw before. The first point here is there are a lot of roads. There is no way I can duplicate this on a playing area unless I use historically accurate road widths, and then it would look more like an actual map that you fold out to you know, go on holiday than an actual playing area. Duplicating roads did cause me some issues, as I've indicated before, but then, you know, as I keep on reiterating, there's, uh, they're only really used to cross water features, and that can be simply duplicated by placing bridges on the necessary crossing points. And um, also to allow units to move faster, and that could be duplicated by the use of a strategic movement rule. As long as a unit never moves within a certain distance from an enemy, we can assume every hex has a road. Thus, the problem is solved. One interesting point about this map, the French had to get over a stream. While the stream was not large, it stopped cavalry and artillery from crossing and caused the infantry significant issues. There are a few figure games I've ever played where the main task of an attacker was to get over significant terrain and both forces comparatively even. I know the French did actually outnumber the Austrian, but it certainly wasn't two to one, and it probably wasn't even one and a half to one. I think this is the key difference between board gaming and figure gaming. Board gaming is all about duplicating a historical conflict or battle. Figure gaming is not in the most part and is more in some ways chess-like. A surprising number of Napoleonic battles were fought between very uneven forces, particularly later in the war. The first half of Marengo, Yina, Bagram are good examples of this. Even at Waterloo, the French had the advantage. It was just those damn pesky Prussians that spoiled their show. This shows my playing area guide for Vergam. Once again, this can be duplicated with a plain, unmarked playing area with custom created terrain features placed on it to represent the battle. The scale here is 1 in 10,000 if I use a 3 by foot 4 playing area. Incidentally, I do have a second scale for the figures where basically each unit is, consists of two elements wide, or 8 centimetres. In that case, the scale here would be 1 in 5,000, and the playing area would be four times larger, or basically 6 by 8 feet. This is a, a viable kind of playing area if you want a monster game, but it just takes too long to set up and pack up, so that's primarily why I went for the smaller unit size. As I've previously mentioned, I do not ever include roads on my playing area. 
although I do include a couple for aesthetic reason. The roads, you know, really are all about water feature crossings, and I certainly do try and deploy nice looking bridge symbols to indicate this. This shows the initial deployment for the Battle of Vagran. While the map, contra the map contrast is reduced in intensity, so the individual elements can be seen clearer. The facing is generic here, and the elements would normally be facing each other rather than what is shown here. It's just the way I put it together. What you can see here is that uh, each element, if you look at an infantry element, consists of four little guys there. That's actually a four centimetre wide element, which is two centimetres deep. Unfortunately, the Austrians, being white, are not that clear on this playing area, but you should be able to see the Austrian front line reasonably clearly. This is not a uh, form up in the open valley and come and get me type battle. It was a battle where Napoleon had to crush the main Austrian army before the Austrian army of Italy could join up with it. If he had already he had already failed once, and in this case, obviously, he needed to succeed. The coalition forces were beginning to learn the art of war finally and not give Napoleon easy wins. The one aspect which strikes me is the deployment. Few figure games would start a game with a deployment similar to this. Incidentally, the French forces on their right flank, which is the left of this screen, uh, crossed the stream at the leftmost position. That was their main attack. The Austrian right flank, which is the right of the screen, advanced against the weaker French left flank and got rather close to the island where Napoleon had placed his siege artillery. I expected, um, I expect they tried, they were trying to cut the French off. In all the games I've ever played, that is this board game, this never occurs. The Austrians are firmly on the defensive. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. Victory conditions can be modified to force a more historical game if you wish. Generally, I do not like the victory conditions in the SPI board games and the board game competitions, which used these quadra games, often extensively change the victory conditions accordingly. Unfortunately, I've lost all those records. I'm going to have to recreate them if I want to actually have a game with victory conditions. The final battle we'll be looking at is Leipzig. All maps, in this case, point north. This is the third day, and it really shows how much trouble Napoleon ended up being in. Luckily for him, there were some heavy forests and waterways between his retreat path and Blücher, Otherwise, it would have been another Ulm. This game was clearly a SPI monster game, that is, monster battle. Leipzig was reproducing a probably one of the largest battles that had ever occurred in the Napoleonic Wars up until this point, maybe even the largest battle period. The ground scale here it remains at 400 metres per hex, or 1 in 10,000, if I'm using a 3 by 4 foot playing area. To keep troop numbers down, the strength point scale was altered a great deal. The battle would include, or would involve, a lot of urban fighting, and there are a lot of built-up areas which were actually involved in the battle. Marengo has more built-up areas, but most were never involved. In this case, fighting in Leipzig is a real possibility, and there is a lot of fighting in the smaller towns on the right of the river. Looking at my uh, playing area guide, this has the most terrain of any of my playing areas, which is surprising considering the ground scale is the same. There are a lot of water features which would result in a massive amount of custom terrain required. The way I do flexible water features is to cut a piece of MDF which represents the river and is about 4 centimetres, four centimetres wider than the river on each side. In this case I would need to create a very wide river terrain piece, piece to represent the double river. But as I do not wish to create a whole 3 by 4 foot playing area, which can only be used for Leipzig, this is what I will do. I will probably also mount the woods on this terrain piece as well to make it easier, although probably I will keep it separate, because if I make it separate I can use it for other games as well. Now we come to the conclusion part. Uh, my conclusion is I need to put a lot more thought into terrain for my Napoleonic's playing areas. I do a good job for World War II and moderns, but my Napoleonic playing areas are not really that realistic, unless fighting in the steppes of Russia. Defensive positions are more common, either built-up areas, small streams or slopes. Opposing forces meeting on a billiard table is possibly not the best way to get a realistic feel for Napoleonic conflict. This shows a DBN built-up area layout. I normally place a maximum of three built-up areas, each of which is much larger than the single element and thus represents a very large built-up area using these rules. 
This shows the same playing area with built up areas the same size as an element, that is four centimeters wide. This is a World War, well, these built up areas I use for my World War II games and I suspect they're more suitable for Napoleonics um, than the um, much lesser but larger built up areas you saw in the previous image. As you can see at the top, you can still have a nice large built up areas, which in this case would represent between 400 and 800 square metre um, built up area. Incidentally, uh, these are the bases of my built up areas. I place the buildings on it when there are no defenders in it, but when there are defenders, the buildings come off and the defenders go in. It works reasonably well for me. While recreating his historical conflicts tends to be self correcting once you do the research, a lot more effort needs to go into generic scenario creation to get something which resembles reality. In World War II, I never fight a meeting engagement between equal forces. That scenario is simply not real, realistic, and if it did occur, which was more often an error than uh, on purpose, the uh, game always ends up being not very good. I suspect I need to move down this path with Napoleonics as well, as most of the better managed battles, or the you know, the more experienced managed battles which occurred later in the war resembled World War II battles for position rather than attempts to destroy an army in a single operational battle. The attempt to destroy an army in a single battle still existed, such as Borodino, but was not the norm post-1812. It was all about recreating Ulm, or Leipzig. Looking at scenarios in more detail, for World War II, my standard scenario has an attacker at twice the strength of the defender, with the defender counterattack midpoint in the game, using a force mix equal to the attacker. This works reasonably well and allows for short half games without the reinforcements, if you so desire. I'm in, I am currently experimenting with an attacker at one and a half times the strength of the defender and a counter-attack force coming in with Napoleonics. This is sort of based on Waterloo. Currently it seems to work, but I have not completed enough test games to be certain. Adding more terrain may make a difference. This concludes a part 36 of my video series on game design theory, in this case a realistic figure gaming terrain. Now off to build some more custom terrain features. Denken Sie daran, immer für Hill, Hamilton zu kämpfen.